Welcome to Walsingham again for the EWTN Lenten series as we reflect on the readings of the fifth Sunday of this holy season of Lent. We are here at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. This beautiful chapel is known as the Slipper Chapel because here it was customary for pilgrims to take off their shoes and walk barefoot to the shrine. The chapel was built around 1340. And apart from the sad, dark days after the Reformation, it has always been a Catholic chapel. Without any more preamble, I want us to go to the very first words of the Gospel. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. The festival, the feast of the Passover, the place, Jerusalem. So what were Greeks doing, going up to the city of the Jews at their great festival? They had gone, we are told, to worship. They had travelled a long, long way to be in Jerusalem. Unless they had settled and were living there, as indeed some Greeks were. Greece was the land of philosophy. The greats, like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, were long dead. But their philosophical schools and others were vigorous and alive in the first century during the lifetime of Jesus on earth. Greeks, many of them, had inquiring minds, pondering the great subject like the purpose of life, the soul. How can you live a virtuous life? Ethics, justice, what is it that makes us really happy? These Greeks who had come to the festival were obviously of that type and somehow or another they'd come into contact with the Jewish faith and were attracted to it or exploring it. What very often appealed, especially to Greeks, were their pantheons and legends about many different gods was monotheism, belief in one God. This was a completely new, a revolutionary idea to them. And it was what set apart the Jewish faith from all other religions. But the problem for the Greeks and others was that the Jewish faith is an exclusive religion. You have to be born into a Jewish family to be a Jew. The covenant God made with Moses was with the Jews alone. But that didn't stop people like these Greeks from being drawn to it. Just before and around the time of Jesus, you could almost say that there was a movement of people wanting to adopt the Jewish faith. And so they were allowed to take part in Jewish worship and rituals. They were given a name, proselytes. Looking at this movement from a Christian perspective, you could see that it was one of the ways in which God was preparing people to enter the church. So these Greeks were proselytes. And here in Jerusalem, they'd heard about Jesus, who was speaking in Jerusalem and preaching there. Everyone was discussing him. So with their open minds, they wanted to find out more about him even hoping to meet him. But how could they get near him with all the crowds? We like hoping to have a word with the Pope on Easter Day in St Peter's Square. Could they get an introduction to Jesus? Well, they did their homework well. They found out about the Twelve Apostles, including their names. And two of them, they noted, had Greek names, Philip and Andrew. This might give them the chance they needed. Maybe if they could meet Philip, he would be sympathetic to them and effect an introduction. So they approached Philip and said, Sir, 
we would like to see Jesus. And Philip told Andrew, there are some Greeks wanting to meet Jesus. So they both decided to go together and tell Jesus about these Greeks wanting to see him. In fact, the original is stronger than our translation. They wanted to be with Jesus, not just see him. This prompted Jesus to reply, Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. That Greeks wanted to be with him was a sign that his hour had come. The hour had come when Jesus gave up his life, not to save Jews only, but Greeks as well, the Gentiles, the whole of mankind. The hour has come for a new covenant, a covenant made with Gentiles as well as Jews. The covenant sealed in his blood and celebrated in the mass. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be poured out for you and for many. The former covenant, as we heard in the first reading, was a covenant only with the Jews, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now a covenant is being made with Gentiles too. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, and these I have to lead as well. It was very much part of this exclusivity of the Jews, especially the Pharisees, that they conspired to put Jesus to death. Jesus was clearly preparing a new covenant. What did they say about the old? Soon after his resurrection, he'd send out the apostles to preach and baptise all nations. And the Pharisees rejected this because of their tradition. They and they alone were the chosen people. The covenant was made with them. Never mind that right at the beginning, when God made this covenant with Abraham, God added that the time would come when all the tribes of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Yes, true, the Jews were chosen, but the day would dawn when that revelation which God gave to them would be shared with all the nations. In other words, the Jewish church would become the universal church, the Catholic church. But the Jewish leaders did not recognise that hour had come. They rejected the idea and rejected Jesus with it. But that rejection, which led to his sacrifice on the cross, became the means of making the new covenant. The hour has come, said Jesus. The hour of my sacrifice. The hour when I will be the saviour of all mankind. And he added, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. On another occasion he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Has ever a prophecy been so fulfilled? I will draw everyone to myself. Greece was indeed the very first country to which the gospel was taken by St. Paul. And then Asia Minor and Europe, the city of Rome and all around the world. Truly has Jesus become to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. And because he died on the cross and rose again, all who follow him are called to live in the paradox that anyone who loves his life loses it, while anyone who hates his life in this world will find it. Jesus spent much of his time among the poor, the
those who were sick and outcast. He preached particularly that he had come to seek out and save those who were lost or thought themselves lost. He was condemned by the Pharisees for mixing and eating with the ones they called derogatively tax collectors and sinners. Jesus lived and gave us a faith that from the very beginning attracted poor people, disabled people, even slaves. Lost and needy souls were brought into this fellowship and this new covenant with God. Treating them with a dignity the world so often denies them. So much so, indeed, that by the year 220, a released slave, no less, was elected Pope. But the faith also did attract the wealthy and the powerful, teaching them that their gifts come from God and therefore to use them well. So, as well as giving dignity to those who are poor, the faith offers those who recognise this dignity in them a true dignity themselves, as well as offering them a whole new dimension of living and purpose in life. Jesus inspires the most remarkable vocations in people who open their hearts to serve him in others, especially the needy. This mystery is the consequence not of Christ's life only, but particularly of his death and resurrection. Christ's sacrifice tells us not to be deluded by this world and all its glamour, not to be taken in by it, not to imagine that true happiness lies in pursuing selfish ends. As regards this world, with all its enjoyments, yet disappointments. Let us not trust it, St John Henry Newman wrote. Let us not trust it. Let us not give our hearts to it. Let us not begin with it. Let us begin with faith. Let us begin with Christ. They alone are truly able to enjoy this world who will begin with the world unseen. They alone enjoy it who have first abstained from it. They alone can truly feast who have first fasted. They alone are able to use the world who have learned not to abuse it. They alone inherit it who take it as a shadow of the world to come and who for that world to come relinquish it. We shall now take a short break and then speak more about the meaning of the cross. Welcome back to our Lenten series where we are reflecting on the fifth Sunday of Lent. It would seem that Jesus spent about a year preparing his disciples to understand that he would give his life for them. After Saint Peter made his profession of faith when Jesus told him that he was to be the rock on which the church would be built, Saint Matthew tells us from that time Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he was destined to go to Jerusalem and suffer grievously at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, to be put to death and to be raised up on the third day. What I want to suggest for your thoughts is that there was something inevitable about his condemnation and death. People who stand up for what is right are applauded by many, but condemned by others. Think of whistleblowers, for instance. It takes courage to point out things that are wrong, but we should stand up for what is true and right. 
especially where an injustice has occurred to someone, or when the defenceless or voiceless have no way of speaking up. We just cannot stand by when they're being hurt, and we cannot walk by on the other side of the road. Jesus spoke up and encouraged us to do the same. Indeed, he says to us that when we do so, we are blessed. Blessed those who are persecuted in the cause of right. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How else really could a life have ended that so challenged and questioned the ways of the world? The world would inevitably take its revenge on a man who showed it up as shallow. And how fitting that the one who'd spent his life among sinners, with society's racial and religious outcasts, poor, sick, lepers, should have died as one of them, outcast, rejected, despised. Everything, in a sense, about the crucifixion was inevitable and fitting. And anyone who looks Christ in the eye will be challenged and invited to live the kind of life he lived on earth. The cross has the most extraordinary power. Sacrificial lives, like those of saints, like those who spend themselves on others, has this power to make us respect, admire, and even try to imitate this life, which is such a contradiction to the way of the world. In Bernard Shaw's great play, Saint Joan, Joan of Arc acknowledged this extraordinary power when she declared before her enemies, I will go out now to the common people and let the love in their eyes comfort me for the hate in yours. You will be glad to see me burnt. But if I go through the fire, I shall go through it to their hearts forever and ever. How true this is. In her own style, she was echoing that prophecy of Jesus. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it yields much fruit. Or when he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Jesus died on the cross for our sakes. He was what God did for us, rather than what we do for God. Nevertheless, he invites us to share in his suffering for others. As St Paul explained when he wrote, it makes me happy to suffer for you, and to do what I can to make up all that still has to be undergone by Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Down the centuries, men and women have been riveted to that cross and self-sacrifice was born there on Calvary. Saint Paul was but the first of multitudes to declare, I have been crucified with Christ. Bound to the sacred heart of Jesus, their hearts have been broken with pity for all those who were in need, starving, for sinners for whom few care or wish to see saved. So Christian saints, and not just saints, and not just Christians, have consecrated themselves and been inspired to seek values other than their personal pleasure, wealth or self-fulfilment. And yet, paradoxically, self-fulfilment is exactly what they find, for this is the only way it can be found. I have known so many people, often well-off people, 
who have experienced this desire to go and serve in some way those we call these days disadvantaged. One is a dear relative of mine, working in a school where there are many children with problems. One child was very upset, and though in the middle of the Covid outbreak in London, she stretched out her hand to hold him, knowing she was taking a risk. And indeed she did catch it and pass it on to her husband. But in the end, compassion recognises no boundaries and compassion takes risks. It is like leaping into the sea to save a drowning stranger. The paradox is that self-sacrifice actually leads to fulfilment. The peace that comes from doing what we know is right. While those who try to seek self-fulfilment through the world are doomed to search forever, unsatisfied, like nobods crawling in the desert. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, anyone who loves his life loses it. Trinkets cannot fill the aching void in a human heart. Yet it is a huge snare and temptation. It often seems the only way to live. St John Henry Newman precisely described it when he wrote, Careless, worldly minds indeed will not believe this. Ridicule the notion of it because they've never tasted it and consider it a matter of mere words which religious persons think it decent and proper to use. Even Peter, after his three years of the closest following, turned away. Unable to face the sacrifice entailed, he declared, I do not know the man. He chose to deny his faith, or at least try to put it on one side. But with one glance from Christ, he changed. When we meet Christ's eyes on the cross, we see the eyes that Peter saw. What was it that Peter saw in the eyes of Jesus after he denied him? Was it reproach? No. Was it disappointment? No. What he saw were eyes of love for him. And that is why he went out and wept. It is those eyes so full of love that draws us to his heart. They are eyes that give us the confidence that we are worth something. We are everything to one who loves us, even to another human being. And we are everything to Jesus, whose eyes look at us with love, make us repent, come back, our failures forgiven. Sins that may seem enormous to us are nothing to Jesus, except in this sense. Our sins become the means by which we experience his forgiveness and love. When anyone forgives us, we love them more. It is a temptation to avert our eyes from Jesus, but when his eyes meet ours, he moves us and calls us. Only when we really turn away, put ourselves out of range of his glance, can we be lost. But even there, he'll seek us. And we'll hear the sound of his voice, even when we cannot see his face. Jeremiah foretold all this. Deep within them, he wrote, I will plant my law, writing it on their hearts, then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Said Paul, who once hated the faith, later wrote, can you believe it? All I want is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to share his sufferings by reproducing the pattern of his death. That is the way I can hope to take my place in the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have become perfect yet, he said. I have not yet won, but I am still running, trying to capture the prize 
which Christ Jesus captured me. I can assure you, I am far from thinking I have already won. All I can say is that I forget the past and I strain ahead to what is to come. I am racing for the finish, for the prize to which God calls us upwards to receive in Christ Jesus. And this is the experience of everyone who thinks and prays. My particular hero, as you may have guessed, is St John Henry Newman, and his experience is just like St Paul's. It must not be supposed, he said, because the doctrine of the cross makes us sad, that therefore the gospel is a sad religion. The psalmist says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And our Lord says, they that mourn shall be comforted. Let no one go away with the impression that the gospel makes us take a gloomy view of the world and of life. It hinders us indeed from taking a superficial view and finding a vain transitory joy in what we see. It only forbids us to begin with enjoyment. It only says, if you begin with pleasure, you will end with pain. It bids us begin with the cross of Christ. And in that cross, we shall at first find sorrow, but in a while, peace and comfort will rise out of that sorrow. That cross will lead us to mourning, repentance, humiliation, prayer, fasting. We shall sorrow for our sins. We shall sorrow with Christ's sufferings. But all of this sorrow will only issue, nay, it will be undergone in a happiness far greater than the enjoyment which the world gives. I would simply say to all of you, in the words of the psalm, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Please join us again next week for our EWTN Lenten series where we shall reflect upon week six of Lent. <laughs>